Welcome, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number four, Ontologies as Key to Knowledge Representation. In this excursion we are going to talk about description logics as a base for knowledge representation. Okay, so why don't we simply use first order logic as we have seen here to form ontologies of that? So we could do, of course, with first order logic you can do almost everything, but of course, yeah, who of you would, let's say, write uh, an, an app with a sampler instead of a higher programming language? So it's not really handy. So first order logic has high expressivity, that's nice, but often it's too bulky for our modeling purposes. And also it's difficult to find consensus in modeling with first order logic. From the point of viewpoint of proofs, uh, proof theoretically, first order logic is very complex, it's only semi or semi-decidable, so this is already, already hard, so there are things which are not computable in first order logic. And of course, first order logic is also not a kind of markup language for the web, so we can't use it for the semantic web directly. We need something that somehow also can be mapped or has a grounding in web technology. And we will see there is a programming language which is called OWL, which is based on a logic, and this exactly then is our uh, means of cho or weapon of choice that we are using. The basic idea is, of course, yeah, if we can't take first order logic in full, so then let's take a fragment that should be appropriate for our purposes, especially a fragment that might be computable. Okay, and then make it a vocabulary for RDFS. And these are the description logics. And this is a family of logic. So description logics are fragments of first order logic. And of course we do here a compromise of expressivity and scalability. A description logic model have concepts, roles, individuals, as well as their relationships. And the description logic from simple descriptions, more complex descriptions are created with the help of so-called constructors. Description logics, uh, usually, if you look at description logics, they differ, you know, from the type of constructors that are embedded within this description logic. So the expressivity depends on the number of constructors that you are using. And they have been developed historically from semantic networks. Most times, especially those that we are considering here, are decidable and they possess, possess depending on the task that we are after, sufficient expressivity, at least most times. They are somehow related to modal logics, but don't go deeper into that if you have no interest in it. But of course, the quantifiers that we are using there are closely related to modal logics. And one example for DL is OWL2DL, and that's a description logic which is called SROIC. And why that strange kind of name, you will understand in a few minutes. In general, we have an architecture for description logic. So description logics form knowledge bases. And you have already seen this in our lecture. So we have a T-box, so a box with terminological knowledge, in which all knowledge about the concepts of a domain are put in. And we have an A-box, so this is the assertional knowledge. And there we have knowledge about all individuals or entities there that are in our knowledge base. And then sometimes also we define something which is called an R-box. So Sometimes this is also referred to as part of the T-box, but the R-box contains the knowledge about roles and role inter interdependencies. And this then forms a description logic knowledge base, which can be the source for an inference engine. And via an interface, you can access it and can draw inferences here over that knowledge base. OK, let's have a deeper look into description logics. Description logics, as we said, is a family of logic-based formalisms applied for knowledge representation. And we look at one of the simplest ones. So this is uh, ALC, attributive language with contrament. And this is the smallest deductively complete description logic. What we have there, we have three types of constructors. We have conjunction, disjunction, and negation. And as you see here, so let me quickly switch on my laser pointer. As you see here, um, conjunction, disjunction, and negation. Negation is the same as always, you know that, but the other two 
here, they are not round, so they are box shaped like, so you see that here. Uh, but they mean exactly the same, but to make clear that we are now dealing with description, log description logics, they are a bit different from the usual connectors that you use in propositional logic or first order logic. And then you have quantifiers, but the quantifiers are not universal or existential in the sense as you know it from first order logic. They are only used to restrict domain and range of roles, which on the other hand helps us to keep complexity in tighter bounds. So this is the most important thing we do here. Okay, the building blocks we have of course are classes, then properties that have here the name of roles and individuals. Simple example, so the individual Isaac Asimov is of class person, is written in the following way. You have person and then you write here in parentheses Isaac Asimov. And this means of course that Isaac Asimov is a person. Or foundation is a book. So book is then the class, foundation is the individual and the individual foundation is of class book. For roles, you can simply say that the book foundation has the author Isaac Asimov and here you, ha you have here the role author and of course you have here two elements, foundation and Isaac Asimov and they are connected via author. So this is quite simple. Okay, let's continue with the formal definition. So in ALC we have so-called atomic types and these are concept names, so this is capital A, B, C and so on and we have two special concepts there. One is the so-called top concept or universal concept which is more general than every other concept and is the superclass of every other concept. And we have the bottom concept which is quite the opposite. This is the most special concept which of course is subclass of every other concept. So top and bottom, we will need them. And then we have here role names, so we start here also with capital letters S, R, S, T and so on, so these will be role names. And the constructors we have here, we already talked about negation, conjunction, disjunction, and then we have two variants of quantifiers. This is the extensional quantification, where we restrict a role R to a specific class here that it has in the range. So the range here should be of class C. We will show you how this works then. And the same then for the universal quantifier, so for all elements that of course are connected via the role R, here the range C is again fixed to a specific class. Okay, look, let's look at examples. First of all, class inclusion. We can say every novel is also a book, so we do this with uh, novel is a subclass of book and we have here the equivalent uh, notation in first order logic, which means for all elements X it holds that if X is a novel, then X is a book. Which means also that, of course, novel is a subclass of book, because every novel is also a book. For the equivalence, it's also easy. If we want to say all prose are exactly novels, we have here the equivalent sign and this means nothing else but for all x it holds that if x is a novel, then also um, for all of its x it holds that they are also prose, so they are equivalent. Okay, conjunction, disjunction, negation, we have here a more complex uh, definition, so more complex class definition of a model, we say here, uh, of a novel, we say here a novel is a subclass of something which is a book and fiction or it's a paperback and not poetry. I know there, were, there might be more elegant solutions to define what exactly is a novel, but this of course is only an example. If you look at it here in first order logic, for all x it holds, if x is a novel, then x is a book and x is fiction or x is a paperback and is not poetry. It's as easy as that. And then the interesting thing for us are the quantifiers and there the quantifiers are distinguished into so-called strict binding and open or loose binding. Strict binding would be the universal quantifier. Strict binding here of the range of the role of a class. We want to say a book must always be authored by a writer. So we say here a book is a subclass of something which is connected by the role author and all of the range 
uh, of the thing that is connected here must be of class writer. Nothing else is allowed. So that's a so-called strict binding. So if we translate this for all x, it holds that uh, if x is a book, then it holds for all y that if y has been authored by x, it follows that y must be a writer. Okay, open binding, on the other hand, this is with existential quantification that fixes again the range of a role to a class. Here we say every book had as has at least one author who is a person. Okay, this works the following way. We say book is a subclass of something which is connected by the role author and in the range of this connection there must exist at least something which is of class person. Of course, it's also allowed that a book can be authored by something else, like for example by GPT or some other language model, for example. Let's have a look at this in first order logic. For all x it holds that if x is a book, then there exists a y. If x is the author of y, then uh, and no, x is the author of y and y is a person. So this is exactly what holds there. You will get used to it and you will see this is quite handy and of course also quite flexible, but it's not as powerful as a real universal quantification or a real existential quantification. But simply by using that trick, um, ALC becomes computable. And there are not cases when you're processing, for example, when you're trying to find out whether something is satisfiable or not, or contains a contradiction or not, um, will not stop. So this is of course quite handy. Now we need production rules for creating new classes in ALC. So usually then A is an atomic class, C and D are complex classes, and we want to define complex classes out of atomic classes and roles. So C and D can be either an atomic class, they can be here the uh, top or the bottom concept, they can be a negation of a complex class, the conjunction of a complex class, the disjunction of a complex class, or the exist a strict, uh, a loose binding, um, attached to a role and a cla complex class C or a strict binding connected to a role and a class C. If I now define a T-box, this contains assertions in the form that of course something is a subclass of something or something which is a complex class is equivalent to another complex class. And an A-box then contains assertions in the form that you know some element individual A is of course member of class C, C is a complex class then, or we have a role that connects A and B together. And then an ALC knowledge base contains an A box and a T box. And this is the syntax, the formal syntax of ALC, which allows you to create um, well-formed ALC formulas. Next we need the semantics for that. So the model theoretic semantics for ALC is also defined via interpretations. Here the interpretations contain always a domain. So this is the set delta i. So this is a domain of individuals and we have an interpretation function i. What does it do? It maps individual names a to domain elements a i of the domain i. It maps also the class name c to a set of domain elements, so you see this is a mapping to set theory, so ci is then a set which is a subset of our do domain. And we have a role, role names are they map to a set of pairs of domain elements. So this would be something role is a subclass of domain d times domain t d. So to make this a bit more or better understandable, we have a nice visualization. You have here an individual A, somehow part of our domain in the interpretation. We have here a subset of the domain. These are all of the classes. And then you see here always two um, individuals connected by each other via an element of Ri, so they are connected by a role. So this is part of a visualization of the model theoretic semantics of ALC. Now let's continue. What else do we have or need an interpretation for? Of course, we have to interpret here the top element. And of course, the top element equals the entire domain we are talking about. That's our universe. And the bottom element, of course, then is, if there is nothing anymore, so the empty set. So the interpretation of the bottom element here would be the empty set. 
Then it's quite easy. Conjunction, of course, of complex classes C and D would be the conjunction of the two sets that correspond uh, to these uh, complex elements C and D, and the same holds then also for the disjunction. If we look at the negation of a complex class C and interpret this, this is then simply our domain, and we deduct simply everything which is in the class C, and the rest then is the complement of C. So closed world here, closed world according to the domain D. And then we have the interpretation of the two bindings. First let's look at strict binding. So strict binding of role R with class C means we are looking of for all of the elements A of the domain D. So we say it holds that then for all elements B of the domain, uh, it holds that um, if we have the elements A and B connected by the role or the interpretation of the role, then it follows that B has to be of class C or for the interpretation, of course, of class C. And the same holds then also for the existential quantification. Okay, so now we have it more or less. So let's have a look at further axioms. So a is an element of class C. It holds that, of course, the interpretation of A is, uh, of course, element of the interpretation of that class. The same here also holds for the roles. And then we have here subset and equivalence, and then we are almost done for our model theoretic semantics in ALC. Now we have defined ILC, ALC. Let's go beyond ALC. We can improve the semantic expressivity of this description logic by adding more constructors. Let's have a look. First thing would be number restrictions. What I can do is I can put a number restriction on a specific role. So I can say, of course, I want to define something with a condition that there are more or it's greater or equal one children or less or equal one mother. I can put here any number that I want to and I can have here of course a greater or equal than, a greater than, a less than or a less or equal than. So that would be a number restriction for a role. And I can further qualify that if I put to the number restriction also um, a class that I restrict the range of that role uh, via the class restriction. So here for example I would say it has to be more than two children have to be female or um, less or equal one parent has to be male. So this is already semantically rather powerful. Third thing I can introduce are so-called nominals. These are closed classes. And by definition of their extension, they can be defined. So I simply enumerate all of its elements. So here, for example, we define a nominal simply by enumerating foundation, foundation and empire, and second foundation, which would be the class of the Foundation series, which is famous books by Isaac Asimov. We can then also go for so-called concrete domains, which are kind of data types. So I can say, of course, I put the restriction on has age, and I say the age, of course, must be larger than 21. Um, another thing would be inverse roles. So I can define the inversion of children would be equivalent to parent. So the opposite of children then, of course, of that role, the inverse role would be parent. That's quite clear. And I also can define a role to be transitive. So this is the definition of the transitive role ancestor. I simply put a plus sign here behind the subclass um, connector. And by that, using that plus sign, everything becomes transitive. And I can also compose roles. So that is role composition. I can say the parent of the brother is the uncle. No, the brother of the parent is the uncle. So I can, can define something like that. So I put together roles. This is role composition. So you see you have many different kind of operators and constructors. So you see here also the syntax that is used for these constructors in description logics. And um, in description logics, to differentiate then the single logics that we are talking about, one is using these um, letters that you see here as names for the description logics that contain exactly these kind of operators. So for example, ALC is the attributive language with complement. And if you then 
do all roles also in a transitive way. So if it's possible to do transitivity, then you have um, the language called S. If you introduce role hierarchies, you have an H. If you introduce nominals, you add an O. If you add inverse roles, you have an I and so on. So there are several ways to extend that. The description logic we will be talking about for OWL2 description logic, this is SROIC. Let us have a quick look. S means we have here ALC plus transitive roles. R, we have role constructors, so we can also compose roles together. Then we have O, we can define nominals. We have I, so inverse roles are also possible. And we have Q, which are the qualified number restrictions. And then we have D, which means we also can use data types. And this then is the description logic that we are dealing with in OWL2. And this will be the subject of our next lecture when we talk about the web ontology language OWL.